Nine verses. Hope you will follow along as I read aloud. Verse number one. And I love I love seeing the um, the repeated things uh, in the Word of God. And this psalm uh, ends uh, like it begins. But verse number one. The Word of God says, "O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is Thy name in all the earth, who has set Thy glory above the heavens." Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. And then we have this Repetition in verse number nine. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So this psalm is about the wonder and exaltation of God. It's about God. It's about creation. And we will see there's no mistake when you compare scripture with scripture. And by the way, you get in trouble when you isolate the word of God. And uh, when you take it in its context and when you take it in its entirety, uh, your, your Bible is a dictionary. Your Bible is a commentary. And uh, when you study things out, it'll sure help you not get into trouble by isolating things. But um, and so we'll see very clearly that this is a song about the Lord Jesus Christ as we finish tonight in the book of Hebrews. And uh, it's about Christ. It's about man. And it's interesting that this song begins and ends with God. And the truth of the matter is, every life is like that. Yeah. God is the creator, and God will one day either be, uh, you'll either meet him as savior, or you'll meet him as judge. But God will be there at the beginning, God was there at the beginning, and the truth of the matter is, and then all of life in the middle is what we've done with the Lord, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you think about it, it's all about God, but it begins with God, and it ends with God, just like life, this song is that way. And good question, for us to think about right there is, are you prepared to meet him? And by the way, it's more than just, are you saved? Are you right with the Lord? Uh, are you right uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you, are you, are you keeping uh, short accounts there? Are you, are you right with the Lord? Are you walking with the Lord daily? And I love the psalmist here. He says in verse number one, he says, O Lord, our Lord. Aren't you glad he can be our Lord, amen. He, he is our Lord. I hope you can say that sincerely tonight, that he is your Lord. He is our Lord. And then the question is asked in verse number four, what is man? Well, uh, when the Bible asks a question, it always provides the answer. Yeah. And so we're going to look into the word of God tonight to answer that question. I want to uh, have my Bible marked in several places so I may go quicker than you can. And uh, at least perhaps take a pen and jot down these verses to consider going back and looking at. We may turn to a couple places together, but some of these I will try to, for sake of time, turn quickly. But again, God provides an answer to that question, what is man? Isaiah 40, verse number 6, the word of God says, The voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. You know, when you think about man, man comes and then man goes, right? And it, it seems like, uh, uh, you know, from a, a, a natural standpoint, and we'll get beyond that tonight as we'll see, um, it seems like there's an insignificance there. But the truth of the matter is uh, that man is the crown of God's creation, isn't he? Yeah. He is. We're going to talk about that tonight for a few moments as well. But the psalmist here in Psalm uh, 80, he, he looks up to the stars and he looks up to the heavens and he, and he, he just uh, he, he sees it all, all the, uh, the glory and the splendor of all that. And he just says to the Lord, Lord, what is what is man that you would be mindful 
of us. You, you would be mindful uh, of us. And so, and, and, and you think about that, but Psalm 8 answers that question. What is, uh, what is man? And uh, with that thought in mind, what is man? You know, can I just say this? I am uh, deeply concerned about homes and deeply concerned about families. I really am. I, uh, listen, Satan is attacking homes and families today uh, with, a, with, with a reckless abandon. He really is. And there's no doubt about that. You, you, nobody would disagree with me on that. Uh, the truth is, uh, we're not going to be able to understand and help the home until we understand this question, what is man? What is man? And when we, under, when we say about what is man in verse number four, he said about mankind, uh, men and uh, women, all right? Because we think about that, what is man? You know, many people think uh, that a mate, a husband, a wife, will bring complete fulfillment to them. You've heard that phrase, and, and they live, what, happily ever after, right? But may I say this, that there is no peace there is no purpose, no fulfillment in life until we understand this question, what is man? What is man? Uh, because uh, the only way we're going to have peace, the only way we're going to have fulfillment, the only way we're going to find purpose is to have an individual relationship with Almighty God. Amen. That's it. That's right. That is it, all right? And, and not another human being. No woman, fellas, can bring complete satisfaction, complete fulfillment, and complete purpose in your life. Ladies, no man will ever bring complete fulfillment, complete satisfaction, and complete purpose in your life. And by the way, no children will do that either. All right. I'm not against you having children. The Bible says, what's this man? How this quiver fool? I encourage that kind of thing. But listen, whether you have one, two, or a dozen, they're not going to bring the total fulfillment in your life. Only God can do that. Right. Right. What is man? He is inadequate to bring that total fulfillment. Right? There is no way. And listen, by the way, God has designed it to be that way. That there is no way that you and I can be all that we need to be apart from Almighty God. Apart from from him. Listen, we are spiritual beings. First Thessalonians 5 23 says that we are spirit and soul and body. And by the way, that's the biblical order. And by the way, you ought to say it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Don't use the words terminology. Well, we're body, soul, and spirit. No, we're not. We are not body, soul, and spirit. We are spirit, soul, and body. You say, well, you're playing with words. No, that's God's word, friend. And God puts the spirit first of all. Yeah. Spirit first of all. And by the way, the body's not going to be right. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. Stay with me, all right? It's not going to be right if the spirit's not right, and the soul's not going to be right if the spirit's not right. But if the spirit's right, then the soul can be right. And if the spirit and the soul can be right, then the body will be right. We are spiritual beings, and that places a necessity on knowing God. Think about how good we are at blaming others for our lack of happiness. Think about how we are, uh, blame others for the lack of purpose or fulfillment, all right? And, 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 and a woman will say, well, he's not giving me uh, uh, all, all that I need, or she's not giving me all I need, or the kids aren't giving me uh, all that uh, I need. Friend, listen, there is not a human being on this earth that can give you all that you need. Right. It is God that we need. God has his eye life that we need him. It must be found in him. Amen. Cannot find it any other way. That peace and that fulfillment and that satisfaction and that purpose can only be found in him. Interesting, look at verse 3. He says, When I consider thy heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. Well, that's a, that's a night picture, isn't it? That's a dark picture. He's looking at the moon. He's looking at the stars. The, the obvious implication here is darkness. Can I say this? You'll learn more about God in your dark times than in your light times. You'll learn more about God in your time of need than in your time of victory. That is so true. Then look at verse number five. He says, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. The word little there, I don't believe has the idea of stature or size. 
Of course, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll talk about it tonight. But I believe it refers to a, a little period of time. For a little time. It refers, of course, to the Lord Jesus Christ who became man without ceasing to be God. And for a little while he was made lower than the angels to bleed for us and to die for us. And again, we know that by comparing Scripture with Scripture, as we will do this evening, because Psalm 2 is quoted several times in the Word of God. And then verse number 6, it says, Thou madest him to have dominion, notice that word, over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. You know, that was God's purpose for us, wasn't it? Yeah. To have dominion. But can I say this? Man cannot have dominion. You know why? Because he would not allow God to have dominion over him. Oh, friend, we'll never learn, uh, uh, we'll never be over until we learn to be under. Jesus Christ had perfect, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. You know why? Because he said, I do always those things that please my Father. Amen. had dominion and creation, but he lost that because of sin. Let's notice three simple thoughts here this evening for just a few minutes. Number one tonight, notice with me, man in compassion. Man in compassion. Compassion. And, and of course, when I speak about compassion, I am speaking of the compassion of God for man. All oh, praise God for his compassion on us. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse number three, the Bible says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. You know what you can say? He cares about me. Amen? Amen? God cares about me. He cares about you, friend. You believe that tonight? I hope you do. I hope you do. He cares. Listen, the Bible says that he loves us with an everlasting love. He cares for us. His loving kindness has drawn us. You see, the amazing part as we go to, if maybe you're still there in Psalm 8, the amazing part of Psalm 8 of that question is not what is man. The amazing part is the second part, which says that thou art mindful of him. That's the amazing part, isn't it? That's the amazing part, that, that, that God would be mindful of us. But friend, he is mindful of us. Amen. He remembers us. He cares for us. He has compassion for us. We are not insignificant. We are significant to God. Praise God for that. He says, he, 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 and the psalmist really is saying here in verse 4, Lord, it's amazing that you love me like you do. It's amazing that you love me like you do. Job chapter 7, verse 17, the word of God says, What is man? There's that question again. That thou shouldest magnify him. And that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him. Think of God setting his heart. You ever set your heart upon something? Uh, maybe your, your spouse, maybe uh, something that you've done or something that you bought. I mean, you just gave your heart to that thing. Hey, friend, listen, God sets his heart on us. God sets his heart upon man. May I say this? He says, what is man? God sets his heart upon man. You see, God places the emphasis on individuals. <laughs> Isn't it sad today, in our world today, uh, that emphasizes animals and plants mm. over man? We emphasize, I mean, to the, to the de-emphasis of people. Yep. You know, the earth days, and, you know, can't cut down a tree, and, you know, I mean, you, 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 can't, uh, you can't cut a, you can't kill a whale, but you can kill a baby. You can't cause harm to a monkey, but you can cause pain to, a, uh, to, a, to an unborn child or even a born child these days. But friend, listen, the emphasis of God, and I'm not saying that, that we ought not uh, uh, take care of, uh, of animals and uh, God cares for all of his creation, sure. does he not? Certainly he does. Certainly he does. I believe you have, uh, you have a cat or a dog or in my case, about 20 fish, not too far from you, back in that office. Amen. Take care of them, do the best you can. But the but here's the thing: I'm not to emphasize them to the neglect of man. Right. The emphasis is on mankind. It's on man. It is man that is eternal. It is man that 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 God places the emphasis on. What is man? 
that thou art mindful of him. Hey, listen. We have a God who loves us. Amen. We have a God who cares about us. And the psalmist was overwhelmed at the thought that God would love him and have compassion on him. So man in compassion, he says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Man in compassion. May I sit, ask you to consider a second thought. Number two, man in creation. Genesis chapter one, verse 26. We find the word that we found here in Psalm eight, and that is dominion. And it says in, in Genesis one and verse 26, and God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And can I just remind us tonight, man did not evolve. Man did not explode. Amen. We were created. We were created full grown. We were created perfect. We are created in the image of God. Mankind was created in the dispensation of innocence by the hand of Almighty God. I'm created to have dominion. But verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. If you look at chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, you think of man's intelligence. Verse 19, For out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every Piled the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature. Think of that. That was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and all the, to the fowl of the air and uh, every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help me for him. The Bible says that we were created in the image of God. And that means that we have spirit, soul, and body. With the spirit, we have God consciousness. We can relate to God. You see, if a man is dead spiritually, or a woman or anybody is dead spiritually, they cannot relate to God. When you witness to them and you say they don't get it, they don't see it, you're right, they don't. They cannot relate. They don't understand that. All right? And uh, uh, Mom Hogan talked about that Sunday night in her testimony. Sam talked about that Sunday night in her testimony. All right? When they got saved. Right? And uh, when you were, we were dead in trespass. We were dead spiritually. But when we got saved, we have God consciousness. We relate to God. Then the soul is the intellect, the emotion, and the will. And then the body. By the body, we relate to the world around us by the five senses that God gave us. Through the spirit, God speaks to us. When people are dead spiritually, the only way they can relate is through their bodies to this world. But not to God. That's why Jesus said, "What well, you must be born again. You must be born again. And if you cannot be born again, you will not see the kingdom of God, of course. Ephesians chapter number 2 and uh, verse uh, number 3. Let me read that to you. The Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You see, without the new birth, we're dead spiritually, aren't we? It's impossible to be all that God wants us to be if we're dead spiritually. Right. Amen. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. You can turn there if you'd like to. I'll give you just a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Don't lose your place in Psalms. But 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And then eventually I'd like for you to turn to Hebrews chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Man in creation was to have dominion. But we sinned and we lost that dominion that was ours. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse number 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things. Gave the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man? Save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. And we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, 
not in the words with which man's wisdom teacheth, but with the Holy, which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. They are spiritually discerned, all right? And uh, again, uh, people get married, people have children, and they think uh, that it will bring fulfillment and peace and purpose. No, listen, only God can give us those things. Amen. Only God can give us those things. And by the way, if there is going to be oneness in marriage, and that's what God desires, if you're going to have oneness in marriage, guess where it starts? In the spirit. Yeah. And then the soul. And then the body. You see, the world is always backwards, and the world is always opposite. The world places all the emphasis on the body, the body, the body, the body, the body. God places the emphasis on the spirit, the spirit, the spirit, the spirit. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. All right? Uh, when, 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 when two people, a husband and a wife, are both walking with God, both loving God, both in God's word, both obeying God's word, both listening to the, the, the word of God. And, and when I'm right with God and my wife's right with God, then the Holy Spirit of God is guiding both of us. And guess what? We're going the same direction, aren't we? Amen. The Jesus in me is not going to argue with the Jesus in her. Amen. Amen. It's true. And then oneness of soul. And again, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm right with God spiritually, and she's right with God, or he, in your case, right spiritually, and then oneness of soul. Then you can agree and tell uh, intellectually and emotionally and share the same goals and the desires of life. And then the oneness of body. But the order is spirit, soul, and body. What is man? Man was made in the image of God. Spirit, soul, and body. And here's the thing. The only way you're going to have five pieces for the Lord. The only way you're going to find peace is through the Lord, all right? Through a relationship with the Lord. And when, when that is right, and by the way, and, and that's why you say, well, why, why are there conflicts this way? The truth of the matter is we have conflicts this way because we're not right this way. When this is right, then all else will be right. Amen. It will. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his rights. All these things will be added unto you. When we're right this way, then we'll be right that way. You say, how do you know, preacher? Because I've been married 26 years. That's how I know. When I'm not right with him, I'm not right with her. I'm not right with him. And I'm not right with her. But when I get right with him, because here's the thing. When I have peace in my heart, peace in my soul, nothing between my soul and the Savior, guess what I could then bring into my marriage? That peace. And I bring that to my children. And I bring that into my family, all right? But here's the thing. Do not expect another human being to do for you what only God can do for you. <clears throat> what only God can do for you. Man in compassion. Man in creation. Now, number three, man in Christ. Man in Christ. Go back to, if, uh, and turn back with me to Psalm 8. I hope you kept your place there. Psalm 8 teaches us that man is lost. Fallen, no longer has dominion over creation. We are sinners. We are headed for hell. We have been ruined by the fall. How did that happen? The first Adam, right? There must be a second Adam. Hallelujah. His name is Jesus, amen. Who is perfect and he can redeem us. How is he going to redeem us? Verse 5 of Psalm 8. Could be made a little lower than the angels. Thou hast crowned him. With glory and honor. All right. And so uh, that is. All right. And so um, he was made that way. He was. Uh, I mean, think about that. Think about who he is. He made himself of no reputation. Humbled himself. Think of all that. And uh, the one who was above all. Then he came and humbled himself. And bare our sin and in his body. And paid our sin debt. And, and died. So that we could be. What only God can make us to be. The psalm is not just about man. It's about what Christ can do for man. As we'll finish off here for just a few moments tonight. The being in Christ and what we have in Christ. And by the way, what we what we gained in Christ. And, and I love, I don't have time to go there tonight. But And uh, in depth. 
But friend, we have much more in Christ than we ever lost in Adam. Absolutely. Much more. The Bible talks about it. It uses those exact words. I mean, much more. Now turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 21 for just a second. Matthew 21. Read some verses here. Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Matthew chapter 21, look at verse number 12. The Bible says that Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And said unto them, it is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame, don't you love that, came to him in the temple and he healed them. Boy, don't you love that. And you think about all the Lord did for them and all, all, all that God did there. Verse 15, and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Notice the next statement. And they were so displeased. Wow. And said unto him, hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, yea, have ye never read Psalm 8? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. Perfected praise. You know what the Bible says we are to praise the Lord for all he has done for us. Praise him for all that he came to do for fallen man. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians, if you would, chapter 15 and verse 20. Paul here, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, writes concerning Psalm 8. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. Verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And then I want you to see the reference to Psalm 8 here, verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits after were they are, that are Christ that is coming. Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. For the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he said, had when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son of Man also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Did you see that there? All things under his feet. Quoting Psalm 8. You see, God gave man dominion and he lost it. Jesus will have dominion over everything. Why did he come? To present dominion to man and to enable him. Listen, one day, praise God, because of that great loving sacrifice, we will what? Rule and reign with him. Is that what the Bible says? It does. Amen. You see, what we gain through the cross is far more than what we lost in the garden. One final place to have you turn to is Hebrews chapter 2. You want to talk about some exciting verses. How about this commentary on Psalm 8? In Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 5. The Bible says in Hebrews 2, 5, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man? Maybe you've heard this before. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the Son of Man that thou visitest him. Look at verse 7. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. And did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put it all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things. But under him. Friend, not yet, but it will be. Amen. It will be. Look at verse 9. But we see Jesus. Who is made, unless there's any doubt who we're talking about. 
who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Thank you. I wonder what the Calvinist does with that verse. Every man. Listen, he suffered, bled, and died for us. Praise God. Look at verse number 10. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect for suffering. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed, hallelujah, to call them brethren. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, and things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Friend, Jesus Christ came willingly, amen. As sinless man, not an angel, as man begins without ceasing to be to be God, all right? Uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to gain back what we lost. The game back. Just think about how he made us the first time. And then he restored that. And praise God by all those things. Made us what he made us in Christ. You see but by the fall we lost fellowship with God didn't we? We became children of the devil by nature. No home to look forward to but hell. No life on earth but bondage. And praise God. God sent his son to defeat the devil. Amen. He tasted death for every man. He suffered our sin penalty. He was buried. Uh, he, he, he died. He rose victorious. And praise God, he's alive yeah. forevermore. Amen. Satan accuses. He's the accuser, isn't he? He said, look at man, God. Look at him. Look at him. I mean, you made him. And they don't even recognize that you even exist. They deny that you even exist. You know what the Lord Jesus Christ says to us? He says, Satan, how about that one over there? That one that's saved, I talk to, I walk with, I have fellowship with, and I'm going to make him in my image. Praise God for that. I'm going to give him a perfect body one of these days. Hallelujah for that. Amen. Friend, the Bible says in 1 John 3, verse 2, that we will be like him when we see him as he is. Amen for that. Think of what man can be. Think of what man is and what we will be in Christ. And it's a wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. Praise God for that. Friend, we cannot be these things in our own, can we? Only Christ can do this. Again, not, not through any other person. Not through any other person. All right? And, and, and we need to stop thinking uh, that uh, our failure is because of somebody else. We must understand that I have a personal relationship with God. That must be most important. We blame others too often. I'm responsible for walking with God. I'm responsible in, walk, in having a right relationship with God and being whom I need to be. I'm responsible to be right with God spiritually. When I'm right spiritually, then I'm right soullessly, and then I'm right bodily. What is man that thou art Mindful of him. What a joy to know that God is mindful of us. Amen. And you didn't go through one thing today that God didn't have his heart set on you. Yeah. To see every single thing. Praise God for that. I'm never like that old song we used to sing. I'm never alone with Jesus. Never, no, never. Alone. I'm not alone. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. Praise God for that. 
What is man that thou art mindful of him? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads bowed tonight and our eyes closed. And I ask some questions in the message tonight.